Certainly good to see everyone out. Good to have everyone with us. Always a privilege for me to be here and sharing God's Word with you. Uh, of course, uh, we have another Thanksgiving in the books, and hopefully everybody had a good one. Uh, I know some uh, uh, the way our schedules are today, our work schedules, are just able to get together schedules. Sometimes uh, it seems that Thanksgiving uh, may start a little bit early and go all the way through to today. Uh, some families can't get together, so we hope that you do have a have had or will have a blessed Thanksgiving, and, and uh, I guess uh, all the shopping has begun. Uh, it seemed like uh, Friday morning, I, Carolyn and I got in a little bit of that, uh, not a lot, but uh, a little bit. It seemed like the parking lots were full of people, uh, and the store that we were in was had several people in it, and it looked like things was kind of returning back to normal. Uh, so that's a good thing for us. Uh, they're determined, seemed like folks was determined not to miss out on those deals that were being offered. I even seen some on Facebook that kind of made it like a vacation. Uh, don't remember the folks' name, wouldn't mention it anyway, but they opened up the back of their SUVs and they were crammed top to bottom, side to side, full of the, of the big deals that they had uh, been able to get. So uh, we don't want to miss out on that good stuff. And uh, here's something that I want to thank. Of course, we're going to start turning our focus now uh, toward Christmas. And I want us to have that same kind of determination that we may have to not miss a, a good deal on something, to not miss Christmas this year. Many people do that, you know. Every year they miss Christmas. The distractions, uh, the trappings around the holiday, the, the simplicity of the birth of Jesus Christ are drowned. They're drowned out. We just don't think about them. Uh, we don't think about, as we zip by down the highway and we see the manger scenes out uh, in the yards that depict that scene, we don't think about what happened on that day oftentimes. Look around. Look how busy we are. Look how distracted we are. What's it, Omicron is the new... Omicron is the new variant just in time for Christmas. Distraction. Nothing should ever be able to distract us from the love of God that came down via his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what I want us to realize. And I want us to think about something as well. And we're going to go back to the Bible. And we're going to look at some examples of some people that were too busy for Christmas and I hope that coming off of the worst part of the pandemic, now they've moved it and classified it actually to an endemic, which means that it will be with us from now on, but will not affect as many people as bad as it had in the past, which is a good thing. That's a progression of a virus. Uh, the flu did that, and we deal and live with the flu. But I don't want us to be so busy trying to make up for the past couple of years uh, that we forget what we're celebrating, that we find ourselves to be too busy for Christmas. So I want to look at some examples of people. And as Harold was praying uh, during communion time, and I was doing a little thinking, and it just it just come to me that we may be more like the times of Jesus' birth than we realize in that the, the world setting and the way that things are in the world and, and the way people's hearts are in the world as well. And I think it's our duty as Christians to kind of lead people back to the meaning of what we celebrate as Christmas. So if you would, open your Bibles. We're just going to look mainly uh, at Matt's, Matthew's account of Christ's birth and Luke's account of Christ's birth and just some of the things. And we're going to see some people who missed Christmas because they were too busy for Christmas. And the first one in Luke chapter 2, verse 7 Luke records this, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The first person that we're going to look at that was too busy for Christmas doesn't even have a name in the account. Doesn't have more than one line dedicated to themselves, and that's the innkeeper. Not a lot's known about, and actually nothing's known about the innkeeper except that he had a full house that day. When Joseph and Mary came, and Mary was 
expecting right on the cusp of having birth. The innkeeper had Christmas right in front of him, and yet he missed it. He missed it because he had to confront a pregnant woman and her husband traveling, seeking out shelter, seeking out a room, and he had other things to attend to. He had guests, and who knows how many guests he had. Maybe he had just a, a small inn, maybe just a couple of rooms. Maybe it was four or five or six rooms. Maybe it was bigger than that. But nonetheless, the room that they sought was not there. Luke says that there was no room for them in the inn. And that's how it was written. If we think about that. Her firstborn child. So she was by herself because of this innkeeper's decision. We never, we maybe don't never think about this, but could you imagine the innkeeper later on? This is where Jesus was born. This is where the wise men came and saw the newborn Messiah. People would have come and come and to see and be there. But he missed that. He missed that opportunity. And it caused Mary to go out on her own. We know the story of the birth. But oftentimes we don't think about the details about Mary bringing, as it says in verse 7 again, look at that with me. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Now you women that have had children, I want you to think about giving birth alone. With your husband, maybe your husband being the only person there to help you. And if he's like most husbands, he probably wouldn't have been much help in a situation like that, <laughs> just to be honest. Especially as young as Joseph could have been at that time, you know, 18 years old or something. You had your child alone in a manger. You had to clean up the baby yourself and wrap the baby in swaddling clothes yourself. You laid your child in a feed trough yourself. No one there to attend to you, not like we have today, not these special birthing rooms where we have lots of attendants and, and lots of uh, people with gloves and gowns and trying to, trying to be as, as clean as possible. And Everybody has a job at, uh, when the baby is born. Somebody tends to mom, somebody tends to the baby, somebody's probably tending to dad, that sort of thing. Nothing. Just you, just the baby, and some animals and your husband because of this innkeeper's decision. It was a lonely birth. It was a lonely birth. And whether it was the innkeeper or a friend or simply a man whose property was where they were at, you know, wherever they were at, this stable. Whatever hospitality Mary and Joseph sought out, whatever situation that they were in, they were nonetheless turned away by this innkeeper because of preoccupation. He was preoccupied. It says there was no room for them in the inn, so he had to be, he had to have a full house, regardless of whatever the full house is. He was so busy. This was, here's something that'll strike home for. This was this innkeeper's Black Friday. He was full. He had full capacity. He had far greater things to worry about than a woman that was getting ready to have a baby. He had all of these people he had to tend to. So he was preoccupied. Preoccupied with, with things. It didn't matter that the Son of God was, was about to be born. He was preoccupied. Many people today are preoccupied. And we find that. Preoccupied with needless, useless human uh, interest. All of those squeeze out room for Jesus Christ. Because our, and I think everybody would agree on this one. Our time is demanded by a thousand different things. We think about that. I just don't have time for anything anymore. Where has time gone? Man, time sure seems to fly by. Our time is demanded by a thousand different things. And I'm not saying they're bad things. I'm not saying they're good things. I'm just saying our time is demanded by things. Just like this innkeeper who 
was too busy for Christmas because he was preoccupied with everything going on around him. So we can first look at him and, and his example that we don't become so preoccupied with things, things going on around us, that we are too busy for Christmas. I want us to think about the effort that we have buying a gift compared to how much effort we have celebrating the gift of Christ. Because we can be distracted, preoccupied with things that are nice, but things that have nothing to do with this celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Things that we enjoy, things that we have always done, things that make up really our lives in so many ways. But when it comes to the birth of Christ, it has nothing to do with it other than be a preoccupation like this innkeeper. So let us think about that as we head into this Christmas season to spend more time adoring Christ and less time being preoccupied with how the world celebrates this. There's another person that was too busy for Christmas. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, we're introduced to Herod. We all know old King Herod. 2, 1 of Matthew says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Herod was very different than the innkeeper. He was very different. He wasn't ignorant. In fact, he was very well informed. He had all information available to him. And believe me, Herod was too busy for Christmas. You can kind of think of him like a head of state today. He had people. If he didn't know, he, his people would find out and tell him. And we find that through the rest of this account, what happens with Herod. The wise men come, starting uh, back in verse 2 there. Uh, we'll see about how his people work on his behalf. Where is he that is born king of the Jews, the wise men said. For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, his people, okay, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, Art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men and inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He pretends, we know the story, he pretends that he wants to worship this Christ, this newborn king. But he was really fearful. He was fearful for this one who was born king that was receiving the attention of these wise men, these magi from the east. Why would a, a king, why would a man in power be fearful of a newborn baby Jew? Well, number one, Herod was an Edomite. He wasn't even a Jew himself. He was a politician because of his father's influence and, and the family influence, he was out for political gain. He was appointed or elected, however you want to look at it, appointed more accurately by the Roman Senate, by the, by the Caesar, the ruler, to govern over Judea. And he must have done a good job keeping the peace because the Romans didn't want to fool with, with the things going on in, in Jerusalem and in Israel, Judea. They, all they wanted to do was have peace and make sure they collected their taxes. And people paid their taxes. And the rest of it was up to Herod and however Herod could go about taking care of this. And he apparently did a good job. His political goals were apparently met in his own efforts. So here this non-Jew who's king over the Jews hears about a Jew being born to be king of the Jews. So he's fearful. Fearful of this 
newborn baby. What kind of fear, Rob? Jealous fear. Herod's fear was that somebody else would take his throne. Herod's fear was that uh, a little child would interfere with all that he had built and all that he had accomplished and all of the political wranglings that he had done that would be upset by this little child, this little Jewish baby, this little child that was born a king. He wasn't going to let this child uh, interfere with his power and his ambition, with his plans, his lifestyle. He's not going to let that happen. That's the kind of fear, not fear of being afraid, trembling, fear of loss of something that meant a great deal to him. Fear of this power that he had. Prestige. And we see people just like that today. We see people that have the same kind of jealous fear because of Jesus. Because he's going to interrupt something that I've been working on and been building and it's so important for me and, and that I place so much value, so much stock in. Uh, I'm afraid of this guy. I want to make sure that I do whatever I have to do to, uh, to make sure he doesn't influence my plans, my priorities, my values, my morals. Those things I might have to give up if this king of the Jews has any kind of effect on my life. Just like Herod was talking about. They want to come to Christ because they've cramped their style. They want to run the show. They want to have their, be their own little Herod in their own little kingdom. They want to be the one that says that this is okay and this is not. They want to make the decrees. And the world is full of Herods. The world is full of Herods that says, this man Jesus will not rule over me. This man Jesus will not cause me to have to give up what I have worked so hard to achieve, accomplish, and have. So we're not really a lot much different than, than Herod himself. They want their own kingdom. They have no idea what they're sacrificing. Because here's the simple fact. You can be your own little Herod. You can rule your own little kingdom, your own little Judea. But guess what? Your kingdom will end at your death. The kingdom of Jesus Christ has no end. So you're sacrificing something eternal for something extremely temporary in our lives. There's another group that Matthew covers here in verse 4 that was too busy for Christmas, too busy for what was going on. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should, have, well, should be born. The chief priests and the scribes, they missed Christmas. They were too busy. They were too busy. Called all of his experts together, the brain trust, the theologians, Herod didn't have to remember because he had people that could and did and do remember and know. These are the experts of the time. They quoted Micah chapter 5 verse 2. We just read that. I'll read it straight from Micah this time. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting, or from the beginning of time. This was God's plan. That's a little more comfort to us to know. That from the beginning of time, God had planned the very thing that we are witnessing here in this account. And the scribes and Pharisees, they didn't hesitate, or Matthew wrote it as such, that whenever... Herod said, where's this baby going to be born? And they said, Bethlehem, according to Micah. They knew where he was going to be born. These chief priests and scribes, in other words, they were the linguists. They were the one that understood language, and, and they could write, and they could record these things. The chief priests knew uh, about all of the Old Testament writings. And they were the experts in religion today uh, for their time. Why did they not go to Bethlehem? Have you ever thought about that? 
Why would the experts in religion, in, in Judaism, the ones that knew of and had read the prophets prophesying of a Messiah coming to be born, they quoted Micah, it wasn't like they didn't know, why did they not go to Bethlehem? Why were the chief religious, the heads of the, of the church, why did they not go check out this baby Jesus? You ever thought about that? I think they do. Well, maybe they just wasn't interested. What about John the Baptist? They were interested when the one that was coming to preach in the wilderness, making uh, the, the path straight and smooth for the coming Messiah, they were there listening to John preach. They had an interest in their hearts and in their minds about what the Bible, what the Torah had told them, what we know as the Old Testament. Why did they not travel five miles south to, find, to this town of Bethlehem to find out for themselves if this was the real Messiah? Indifference is why. Indifference. They didn't care. Really the ultimate insult because these men had all of the facts. They apparently just didn't care. They didn't need a Messiah. They were already self-righteous. Did Jesus preach against that a few years later from then? They were already all God could ever want. Just ask them. They were already the upper crust. They weren't needing a Messiah. They were all right just exactly the way that they were. Many people today are too busy for Christmas because of that same thing. I don't need to humble myself. I got no sin in my life. What more could God want when he has me? I've got everything figured out. I don't do anything wrong. We don't need no Messiah. We don't need no Savior. We don't need no baby in the manger. I've got it all figured out. That's the kind of attitude that these scribes and priests had and that's the same dangerous kind of attitude that many people have today they're self-righteous they're indifferent because they believe that everything they do is okay but they don't compare it to the example of Christ and we find out that all have fallen short it's what the scriptures tells us but not these chief priests and scribes they don't understand they need to be saved people today they didn't understand it. Jesus goes on and teaches all throughout the scriptures. We find those accounts where they still didn't understand that, that they need to be. Didn't Jesus come, tell them that he didn't come for those that were, were well. He came for those who were sick. They just didn't understand that they were sick. We have many people today that don't understand that they're sick. They don't understand that they need repentance. They don't understand that the wages of sin is death and that sin plummets people to an eternal hell. Just like these men here, chief priests and the scribes. They were too busy for Christmas because of their indifferent pride. It's another group, this is a much larger group in itself. Looking back to Luke chapter 2 this time, verse 8. The whole of Jerusalem. And there were in the same country. Now that being the same country. We're talking about five miles between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. That's about like from here to the interstate. Not a lot of distance. Not a lot of distance between the two. And Jerusalem was right there and they missed it. Most of the people in Jerusalem missed Christmas because they were too busy. Angel told the shepherds, if we recall, look at verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Who was they returning, where was they returning to? Well, their flocks. We don't know how many shepherds there were. We don't know how broad that call was from the angel that told them to go. But we do know what, the, what Luke records here and says that and the shepherds being more than one 
returned glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen. Where did they return to? Their flocks, which were in that country, around Jerusalem, around Bethlehem, in that country. So here we have this city, Jerusalem. And who did God use to deliver this message? Not the cream of the crop, not the top, top shelf people, but the bottom shelf people, the shepherds. Despised they were. Why? Why were shepherds despised? Well, they were always out tending the flock. They couldn't know about the, the ritual that the chief priest and the scribes made sure that everybody knew about, the, the washings, the feasts, the festivals, those sorts of things, because things that were endangering the flock didn't take a day off to do that. So the shepherds had to stay. They had to always continually tend the flock. And they were despised for that. They were outcast. They were the ones that came. No one else. The majority of Jerusalem was too busy for Christmas, even though it was just a short distance away. They were too busy for an event that would change the destiny of the world. Why? Religion. Religion had them so engulfed. They were so tied up. They were busy with their festivals. They were busy with the ceremony. They were busy with the washing. They were busy with all of the things, all the trappings of their religion. And Jesus told them this all throughout his ministry. That he would rather them have mercy instead of sacrifice. They were so caught up in their religion that they missed the most life-changing event known to man. And it's easy to do. It's easy to do. In the midst of all of the religion, they never got the message. Maybe they didn't know. They knew. How do you know they knew? Because the chief priest knew. Whenever Herod said, where was this baby going to be born? Whose job was it to teach the people? Chief priest. The chief priest know. The people know. They knew. They were too busy doing all of those rules and regulations that they had themselves added to what God's word said and kept people so busy that their religion kept them so busy they missed the birth of the Messiah. What about that today? Do you think that we have people that are so secure in their religion they're so wrapped up in what their religion calls for them to do, and I'm not being critical of anything. I'm just saying, I'm asking us to think for a minute. Do we have people that are so caught up in their religion that they miss the birth of Christ? They miss what a life-changing, earth-changing event the birth of Christ is. Because this whole city of Jerusalem did that. Right along with the next group, which is the Romans. Look in Luke 2, 1 again. And you think about the Romans. Everything in Jesus' life, what we have to realize, Rome is there from the beginning to the end. Rome. Roman soldiers, Roman leadership is all involved with Jesus' birth, most likely throughout his life, and certainly his death. Caesar made the decree that sent his mother and father to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy by Micah. Rome's involved. The census, Rome's involved. Of course, we know Jesus before Pilate, Rome's involved. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was carried out by who? Roman soldiers, Rome's involved. The burial, the guarding of the tomb was by whom? Roman soldiers. Rome's involved in the resurrection because who fell as they were dead men, the scriptures tells us, whenever the angel rolled the stone away? The soldiers that were guarding the tomb. Who did the chief priests and scribes pay off to say they stole the body instead of the angel rolled the stone away? Roman soldiers. 
Rome was involved in this account of Jesus Christ from beginning to end, and they missed the very thing because of idolatry. Idolatry. False gods. They had their own gods. Christ didn't fit into that. And there have people in the world the same way today. Many false religions. Well, let me just say it this way. If it is a religion that is based on something other than Jesus Christ, Son of God, born, lived, teach, tried, put to death, resurrected, it's a false religion. Period. And that's where the Romans were. They were worshiping the wrong God. Jerusalem was worshiping the right God the wrong way. <laughs> the Romans were worshiping the wrong God, period. And they, they, they had to hear about the miracles of Christ. I know they witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They accepted bribes not to tell the truth about that part. Do you think that it didn't go around about just in their conversations, even among the soldiers? I don't care what they said. I don't care what they believe. Jesus was, that angel, something rolled the stone away, and Jesus was not there. And his people didn't take him. That was the conversation that was being had. Well, why don't you tell somebody? Because they give me this money not to, and I'm scared to death I'll die. I'm scared to death that Pilate will have me put to, get, put to death for failing to do my duty of making sure nobody took the body out of the tomb. What about the ones that were at the cross? Those Roman soldiers witnessed everything that happened there. Idolatry. We have that today. We have people that worship idols just like they did then. But even more, we have people that have other gods. They worship money. They worship sex. They worship cars, materialism, boats, power, houses, whatever, prestige, popularity, fame, those are pagan gods. They are led away by those pagan gods from the reality of the Messiah, the Son of God, the true Christ. And they're no different than the Romans were at the time of Christ. And then we have our last group. Luke 2, 39. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city of Nazareth. Nazareth. Their hometown missed it. He was a little older then, but their hometown missed Christmas because they were too busy. They were too busy. They were too familiar. Scripture tells us that in verse 40, that the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. <laughs> Jesus was no doubt a special child in this town of Nazareth with that description that Luke gives us. He was an exceptional child. He was one who in a small town people would have known about the exceptions that he was Versus a regular child. We know that 12 years later or so, 10 or 12 years later or so, he went to Jerusalem and what? Astounded the chief priest and the scribes with his knowledge of the t and teachings of God's word. At 12, he was an exceptional child. He was one that they had watched grow up. He was one that they very well knew his mom and his dad and knew about what his dad kind of work his dad did as a carpenter. Very familiar with this guy. And that same being familiar bred contempt. Bred contempt. Luke 4, verse 24, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is, is accepted in his own country. John 1, verse 46, we have a slide. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. This whole region had a, had a bad uh, reputation. But something wonderful came out of Nazareth. The Son of God. Jesus Christ, our Savior. He came out of Nazareth. And we too... can be too familiar sometimes. 
We can hear it so many times, so many Christmas stories, so many Christmases, so many sermons, so many Bible lessons. We can become so familiar with the wonder of God's love that we really have a little contempt for it. And I don't mean ill-gotten contempt, just the fact that we don't place the infant, the we don't place enough emphasis on truly what happened. Because we, we are too familiar sometimes with what's going on. And that was the problem in Nazareth. If you look at Mark 6, verse 6, and Matthew 13, verse 58, it says that Jesus marveled at their unbelief. And it says that he didn't do many miracles there because of their unbelief. You know where he's talking about? Nazareth, his hometown. Marveled at their unbelief, the place that this exceptional child grew up, the place where the boy that was able to go to Jerusalem at the age of 12 and astound people with his knowledge of the scriptures, his hometown, unbelief. That's being too busy for Christmas. And there's a lot of reason why people miss it. Preoccupation. Jealous fear, prideful indifference, religious ritual, false gods, being too familiar with Christmas. But behind all of those is one basic reason. It's unbelief. They don't believe the story, the account of the Bible. They don't believe that the Son of God came down and was flesh like me and you. They don't believe that what the Bible says happened, happened. They don't believe God's word to be true because if you do, you cannot help but to react. You cannot help but to say, I need this Messiah. I need this Savior. And sometimes we can be too familiar. We can be raised up in church our whole life. We can know about everything. We can know all about the Bible stories, the Sunday school stories, the VBS stories, the, the lessons that we've learned, and we can be so familiar that we, we just never, we put it off, we put it off, we put it off, and we never accept Christ, and it's too late. It is too late when either Jesus returns or something happens that, that I, I die, whether by natural causes or an accident or a disease. Yeah, I knew it all. I just really didn't believe it all. Because if I believed it, I would have had to have acted on it. Unless I'm like one of these people that Rob's talked about this morning. And that's what I want us to not be. I don't want us to be like the example of anybody that I read. I don't want you to be the innkeeper. I don't want you to be Herod. I don't want you to be like a chief priest or a scribe. I don't want you to be like the city of Jerusalem or Nazareth. I don't want you to be someone that is so familiar with this story of, of the account of Jesus Christ's birth that you are too busy for Christmas. Now maybe you're here today and you never accepted Christ as your Savior. I hope just through this account that we've looked at this morning that that may breed belief in you. And if you're willing to repent of your sins, confess Christ as your Savior, because that's where it all begins, is when you make Christ the Lord of your life, that's when the change begins. Being buried with him in baptism. Raise that new creation. You've got forgiveness of sins. You've got the gift of the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you through this life. And you walk faithful. You do the best that you can do guided by the Holy Spirit from here on. Now maybe you've done that. But you realize that maybe there's a little bit of one of these examples in you. And I want to encourage you to get, get rid of it. Get it out of there. There's no room for it, no room for any of these examples in the life of a Christian. And that's up to, between you and God to take care of. We're going to sing this hymn of invitation, Where He Leads Me. Will you, will you be led? Will you be led by Christ? Because where He leads me, it says that we will follow. We're going to sing the first and the third verse of this hymn. If you have a decision to make, would you come as we stand and sing?